Okay, here we are. Well, I'm really um, pleased to welcome Kelly Bergson, who stayed up extra late for us <laughs> um, to give this talk. So I really appreciate her joining us from Indiana. Um, and she's also being joined with her PhD student. Um, oh, who's just, there it is. Okay, Samson. Um, and also from her co-worker in North Texas, Shabana. Um, I'm going to let Kelly introduce those people because um, I know Kelly better than I know <laughs> the other two. Um, so I first got to know Kelly's work when she was um, when I was editing her paper that she submitted to the Journal of Phonetics on Marathi, and it was an exploration of um, breathiness in sonorants in Marathi, and you know, and, and an attempt to explain why such sounds are so rare, um, why breathiness is so rare on sonorants. Um, and Kelly. Um, actually did her first degree was in English um, at Vassar College in New York. Is that, is that right, Kelly? Okay, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. And then she actually worked in publishing for a long time um, before she went back to study, um, yeah, to study linguistics at the University of Kansas. Um, and so she did her MA um, at the University of Kansas on the nature of optional sibilant harmony in Navajo. So that's a North American language, um, as many of you probably know. And, um, and at the same time, she did an MA on Global Indigenous Nation Studies. Um, and her thesis there was a crash course in linguistics for language revitalizationists. So that's giving you an idea where she's coming from. Um, and her PhD was also from um, University of Kansas eventually. Um, uh, and that was on Marathi, on phonation types in Mar Marathi and acoustic investigation. Um, and so soon after that, she um, landed in Indiana, where she is currently an assistant professor uh, of linguistics. And she's also the founder and leader of the Chin Languages Research Project. And that's actually why I invited her, her to talk to us, because she is, um, you know, she, she's clearly, I've only hinted at a couple of the languages she worked on. She's actually worked on very, very many languages. Um, and as you can tell by that brief history I've given, she's someone who's very interested in community engagement um, with language. So um, I thought that would be particularly relevant to our department. So I'm really pleased, so pleased that she's been able to make time to come and talk to us with her co-workers who I'll leave her to introduce and I'll sign off and um, turn off my screen so you don't have to see me. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much. I'm, we're happy to see you, by the way, but um, I am going to share my screen. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and, and us. We're really happy to be here today to tell you a little bit about the Chin Languages Research Project, which is um, sort of a developing community of collaboration here in Indiana. Um, you will hear from me. You will also hear from Samson Lotvin, who is a PhD student here in Indiana. He's um, finishing a dissertation on Zope, and you'll hear a little bit about his work. And um, Shobana Chelia, who is a, a collaborator um, and a, a member of the Chin Languages Research um, team. And um, Shobana and I will talk at the end of this presentation about some of the collaborative work that that we're doing right now that has a, a community orientation. So I will dive in and I will just say that the, um, the, the big picture here, what I'm, what I'm going to be talking to you about today um, is work that we've been engaged in for about three years at this point. So about three years ago, we, we began working with the Burmese refugee community in Indianapolis. Um, that community is uh, mainly Chin, so they are from Chin State in Burma. And I'll talk a little bit about um, our research team, who we are. I'll give you a brief overview of the Chin community in Indianapolis. And then um, Samson and Chobana and I will talk about several of our ongoing projects. So you'll get just a little bit of a uh, think of this as a like a some hors d'oeuvres. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about some of the projects that we're working on, and then happy to take questions about any of them during the the question period. So to begin, we have to sort of jump away from Indiana and look at Burma. This is a map of Burma that you're looking at here. We're really going to be focused on languages that originate in Chin State, which is the state in sort of pink that's circled on this map. Um, Chin State is right next to Bangladesh and Eastern India. Uh, it's home to about 500,000 people, according to the 2014 census. And um, 
the the state is home to many different um, sort of sub-ethnic groups. So sub-ethnic Chin groups, there are 53 that are officially recognized. These include uh, names that you may be familiar with, Dai, Lai, Lushai, Matu, Mara, etc. And the state is also home to um, a, a relatively large group of Chin languages. The um, Kuki Chin languages are a sub subgroup of Tibeto-Burman. There are 50 or more languages we estimate that are spoken in Chin State. Um, although honestly, this is uh, this is really subject to um, a lot of guesswork at this point. These languages are also spoken in Eastern Bangladesh and in Eastern India. Uh, and for reasons that I'll talk briefly about, they're also spoken in Indiana. So Indiana is the state that's highlighted in red and circled on this map. And um, Indiana is home to about 25,000 Burmese refugees. It's one of the largest communities um, of Burmese refugees in the United States. And uh, Indianapolis, which is just about an hour north of the Indiana University Bloomington campus, is home to the majority of this population. So um, there are about 20,000 Chin refugees living in Indianapolis. Uh, one sort of indicator of the robustness of this community is that there are 40 or more Chin churches in Indianapolis. Churches are often um, differentiated based on, uh, for example, village or ethnic identity or language. These churches are largely Baptist, and um, the the Chin in general are are generally Christian. This is sort of relevant for a reason that I'll get back to in a moment. But we really do have to think about a set of kind of larger circumstances in the world to understand why there's this big population in Indiana. So, according to the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, rates of forcible displacement today are higher than they've ever been before on record. There are about 80 million people worldwide who have been forcibly displaced. Someone new is forcibly displaced every two seconds. And so if we spend 60 minutes together today during this talk, um, about 1,800 new people will be displaced during this talk. Um, we could talk a lot about what that means, the, the reasons behind it, but uh, what you may have noticed on the map of Chin State is that it's directly north of Rakhine State, um, where uh, a lot of military aggression against the Rohingya has occurred. Um, there has been military aggression in Chin State as well. So these, um, these facts are sort of relevant. What this plays out like, so what this sort of ends up looking like on the ground in Indianapolis is that Indy is home to between 15 and 20,000 Burmese refugees. They are not exclusively from Chin State, but they're largely from Chin State. Many of them don't speak Burmese, but there are 30 or more Chin languages that are spoken really robustly by hundreds or many thousands of people in Indianapolis. And there are also a lot of Chin undergraduate students at IU. So uh, between 80 and 100 undergraduate students from the Indianapolis community uh, at this point in time. We really began working with members of this community uh, when we started working with students in field methods classes. So it was field methods classes and the field methods context that was the beginning of this relationship. But as we began to do that work, we of course also began to learn a lot about community needs. And that's because we were working with these undergraduate students from the community who were serving as consultants in uh, language, uh, in field methods classes. And those students really regularly engage in interpretation and translation. So they are traveling back and forth. Okay, right now because of COVID, a lot of people are living at home in Indy. But um, in a non-COVID year, students from this campus would be traveling home pretty regularly to help with all manner of interpretation and translation needs. So this is true in sort of urgent settings like emergency room visits or doctor's appointments, um, accompanying parents to parent-teacher conferences for younger siblings, etc. But then there's also a lot of sort of interpretation and translation needs in more day-to-day -day situations, trying to deal with um, people at car dealerships or working through insurance forms with insurance agents, HR forms when parents are getting new jobs, etc. So the students are really doing a lot of work. 
And it was against that backdrop of us as linguists starting to learn about this work and the situation that exists in this community very close to us that we really decided to develop this Chin Languages Research Project. CLRP, the, the Chin Languages Research Project, is really just a collaboration, a developing collaboration, I would say, between speech scientists from IU and other institutions and members of the Indianapolis Chin community. These are uh, some of the members of our team, although this is not sort of exhaustive, but you can only fit so many small pictures on a, on a PowerPoint slide. And um, you may be able to tell just by looking at this slide that our team members really come from some different kind of bins, if you will. So we think about the CLRP as being made up of students from, from IU at this point, although presumably students from other schools may join us at some point. Uh, this includes both Chin undergraduate students and also um, undergrad and graduate linguistic students. There are community members in Indianapolis, so for example, the parents or younger siblings of our students, um, but we also interface a fair amount with church leaders and elders. Uh, there are members of local organizations and businesses who we work with, so um, speech language pathologists from some of the schools in uh, Indianapolis have reached out for help with language identification, stuff like that. Uh, there's an institute called the uh, Burmese American Community Institute that does a lot of college prep, and we've worked with them to some extent. And then there are faculty members, not only from IU, but also from other schools um, who hail from a bunch of different disciplines. So linguists, computer scientists, et cetera, et cetera. And we all sort of come together and try to think about addressing both the sort of practical needs of the, communi of the community um, and explore scholarly opportunities in tandem. So we're really trying to do these things at once. So just to sort of recap, the scholarly opportunities really um, stem from these facts. So there are 30 or more Chin languages that are being spoken just an hour away from our campus and also being spoken right on campus. All of these languages are under-resourced and many of them are undocumented. So there's just a tremendous amount of work to be done. They also tend to exhibit a lot of typologically rare properties. So there's just the opportunity to do a lot of scholarship um, kind of right in our backyard. And in terms of the practical needs, you know, as linguists and as members of, the, uh, of a university, we have access to a lot of resources. So we can really help with resource creation, we can engage in advocacy for our students. We can uh, really help to support student research uh, opportunities. And um, we're trying to nurture some community linguists. So what we'll do in the remainder of this talk is um, kind of run through some of the, the uh, projects that, that can be worked on. Uh, when you have access to a group of um, young, enthusiastic speakers of underdocumented languages who happen to be students on campus. Because the really sort of um, exciting thing from our perspective is that we're linguists. The only thing we need to do our job um, is language data. Those data can be on any topic. Our students know what topics need to be worked on, what topics are sort of critical for the community at any point in time. So if what we need to be uh, working on, talking about, et cetera, is the census, we can do that. If we need to be talking about the election and information about candidates, we can do that. If we need to be talking about COVID uh, information, we can do that, right? So we have sort of this rich opportunity. In um, the next slides, I will take a little bit of time to do just an itty bitty um, sort of quick and dirty overview of some Chin basics, so Chin 101. We will talk about um, just uh, some of the phonetic and phonological projects and opportunities that we're investigating, and then we'll close by spending a, lot of, a little bit of time on community-oriented projects. Okay, so Chin basics. I actually can't see my time, so, okay, there we go. Okay, um, right, so if we return to this map of uh, Burma slash Myanmar, uh, you've seen this map before. 
action state was circled here. If we zoom in and look at a, a map recently put out by SIL um, of Chin State, we see that there's just a tremendous amount of language diversity. So every one of these uh, color blocks represents a different language in Chin State. We, uh, at this point, have really been focusing on three languages that are sort of spoken in, in this region. So if we zoom in on that region, we've been focusing on Hakka Lai, on Zopei, and on Lautu or Lutuv. So these three languages you'll hear more about. Um, the, these three languages are spoken by um, 200, about 200,000 people worldwide for Hakka and about 10,000 people in Indy. Hakka is the lingua franca in Chin State and also in Indianapolis. There's a little bit of existing work on this. It, there's some really excellent work on it, actually. Um, there was a cohort at Berkeley that put out a bunch of work on Hakka, and Kenneth Van Bick, who's one of our team members, um, is a native speaker and a linguist and has been working on Hakka uh, for a long time. We are also working with Lutuv, which is spoken by about 18,000 people worldwide, maybe 2,000 2, people in the US and 600 in Indianapolis, and then also Zopay, which Samson will talk about a little bit later on. This is spoken by maybe 20,000 people worldwide and about 4,000 people in Indianapolis. And just to sort of give you a bit of a, a sense of um, kind of uh, the, the numbers in Burma and elsewhere, Long Tlong Zopay is one of the varieties that Samson has been working with. And um, people from Long Tlong Village have a very uh, clear sense of where village members are at this point. Their estimate is that there are 360 speakers of Long Tlong Zopay left in Long Tlong and about 390 in the US. So um, there's a lot of uh, migration out of, out of Chin State. Uh, oh, what I didn't say is that uh, for Lutu and Zope, there there wasn't um, prior linguistic work on these languages um, outside of the work that we're doing here in Indiana. Okay, so the quick and dirty overview: Chin languages in general tend to be tonal, although there are some that are not. Um, they are verb final. They tend to have this iambic sesquisyllabic word structure that languages from that region um, are sort of famous for. They often have um, numeral classifiers. We'll see an example of some of those in a moment. Um, Post-verbal negation, verb serialization. There are transitivity alternations. So verbs often have multiple verb stems. A couple of um, interesting, unique tidbits. They often, these Chin languages often have uh, multiple demonstratives. So these are examples from Hakalai, Witso he, this dog, so he is this, um, Witso ka and Witso ki, so ka is um, uh, the sort of uh, proximal demonstrative and that is the very distant distal demonstrative. So um, that, but that's close to us and that that's much further over there. There's an even more extensive system in Lutuv. So it seems to be the case that Lutuv has five demonstratives. Um, this is from very recent work that's, um, you know, a little bit preliminary, uh, but there is hing, which is this, and then there are four versions of that. So ka is just the general that, hue is that over there, ku is that up there, and kuv is that down there. So five different demonstratives in Lutuv. Uh, numeral classifiers uh, are, are relatively common, so they are falling out of use in some of the Chin languages. There are very few that are utilized at this point in time in Hakka, although there's just a handful that show up, but they've mostly fallen out of use. There seem to still be a relatively um, big system of numeral classifiers in Lutuv. So in this little set of data, you see that there's the sort of general numeral classifier. So Hning is two, um, but it almost never occurs on its own. It almost always has this piece in front of it. So Suo Hning. And then we have the Se, which is the animal classifier. We have Gung, so Kung Hning, if we're counting two trees. Um, ba is the human classifier. 
Chu is the fruit classifier, Zong is the clothing classifier, and we've found maybe 20 to 30 classifiers right now. This is um, sort of preliminary work, it's ongoing. Uh, a lot of the classifiers seem to be falling out of use even in Lutuv, so we're working with um, someone who is in her early 20s, and for many of these items and sort of more unusual nouns, she will say, well, I say suoning, so she'll count using the generic classifier, but my mom says, so mom still has a more robust system of numeral classifiers than Sui does. Um, so maybe this is uh, becoming simplified in Lutuv as well. I'm, I'm a phonetician and a phonologist by training, so I gave you a few tidbits about uh, other things, but what I have really been focusing on the most is the phonetic and the phonological stuff in Chin languages. Um, so this is just the sample inventory so that you can get a sense of what a consonant inventory in a Chin language might look like. This is for Hakka, so it is not... Um, the case that every language has this many consonants, but it's pretty common to have uh, three stops. It is pretty common to have voiced and voiceless nasals, as well as voiced and voiceless rhotic and lateral uh, consonant sounds. So I just want to point out that that's um, one of the things that made me very excited when I started working with these. As Maria noted, uh, my earlier work was on phonation type contrast in sonorants. I had worked with Indic languages and with breathy, uh, breathy sonorants before. So here's why it's really exciting to be starting to work with these languages that have voiceless sonorants. If you look at um, just some kind of basic stats for the frequency of occurrence of various consonant types in the world's languages. These are data that come from Foible, um, which is a, an online database of basically segment inventories in many world languages. What we see is that the plain sonorants, so plain M, plain N, plain Engma, etc., the plain sonorants show up very commonly in many of the languages that are indexed in Foible. Voiceless versions of each of those sonorants uh, show up much more rarely, right? They are uh, attested far less frequently than the plain sonorants, but they are themselves much more common or much more frequent than the breathy sonorants. And so um, the, the kind of observation that we can make is that non-modal sonorants in general, so whether breathy or voiceless, they're typologically rare across the board. But what is true is that breathy sonorants are innovated rarely and lost easily. So they just don't show up, um, you know, almost ever, right? They are quite, quite under attested. The voiceless sonorants, on the other hand, are really robustly attested and they're diachronically stable in Tibeto-Burman languages in particular. And so one of the things that's sort of keeping me up at night these days is this question about why are voiceless sonorants uh, more stable than breathy sonorants, right? Um, part of how we're working to uh, get at that question is a large-scale acoustic study of voiceless sonorants in Hakka, in Hakka Lai. That started right before COVID hit, so we, we recorded data from just eight participants and then everything got shut down. So stay tuned, it will be a while before we hear more about that. Um, but there hopefully will be interesting things to say in the future. And there are also some interesting things that we could say about the patterns of retention and loss that we see in voiceless sonorants across Chin languages. So if we have time at the end, I'll ask you to ask me about that. Um, I just want to point out one other thing that is sort of interesting. A very dense high vowel inventory is relatively uncommon uh, cross-linguistically, but seems to be pretty common in the Chin languages that we're working with. Samson will talk to you a bit more about this in just a moment, but I do want to show you um, the, the vowel inventory for Lutuv. So as I mentioned, we just started working with Lutuv this past January. We only had three months of um, field methods with Lutuv before we all dispersed and went online. But in those three months, we were able to um, establish that this is the Lutu vowel inventory. All right, 
unplugged my microphone, so I think that this should work. I'll play one, and then if somebody could nod to me or give me a thumbs up if you hear it, that would be great. Gee. We can hear it. You hear? Okay, great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just play across the entire top uh, of this inventory, and then we'll move to the lower ones. They are not as interesting. I would imagine that for those of you who are sort of inclined in the phonetic direction, it's going to be this territory right here that you'll find interesting. I'm only going to play things once, but we can come back to this at the end if anyone wants to hear more. So we'll start here. Ki. Ki. Ku. 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 Ke. Ka. Kolong. Ka. Okay, so those uh, sound files, you may have noticed that there are tonal differences. I have not managed to get a, a sort of minimal set in terms of the tones, but that gave you a little bit of an overview of what these things sound like. If you had trouble distinguishing between some of these vowels, I just wanted to show you this very preliminary acoustic data so that you feel um, like, okay, yes, I had trouble distinguishing between some of them because there's a tremendous amount of overlap. So one of the things that we're really uh, looking forward to investigating in the future is this high vowel inventory in Lutuv. It's pretty clear that what distinguishes these vowels is more than just F1, F2. So a basic F1, F2 vowel plot, which is what we're looking at here, um, there's some separation, but there's also a tremendous amount of overlap. It seems clear to us that there's something going on with uh, formant dynamics, so the movement of formants, as well as phonation type that's um, contributing to this contrast, but uh, stay tuned on this one as well. And now I'm going to turn it over to Samson, who will talk to you about vowel shift in Zopay. Hi, thank you, Kelly. Well, my name is Samson Lotvin. I've been working on my dissertation on the sound systems of Zopay. Um, if you'll follow me to the next slide here. I've been working with three varieties of Zopay, um, but the onsets are fairly uh, consistent between these varieties. So there's some interesting things in the onsets, just like we've seen for the Hakalai onset system. There are the voiceless uh, sonorants. There's also the lateral affricates. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about these today. I kind of wanted to focus on another aspect of the dissertation, which has to do with uh, several of the vowel changes between varieties. So here we've got um, the rhyme systems of three different varieties of Zope. Uh, across the top, we've got Tlongjrang Zope, uh, through the middle, Nuita Zope, and then across the bottom, Longklang Zope. Uh, these three varieties are organized this way because the Tlongjrang variety is the uh, most conservative variety, and the Longklang variety on the bottom is the most innovative variety, at least phonologically speaking. Um, across uh, these diagrams on the left, uh, you have the long and short monophongs in each system. Uh, in the center, uh, there are the diphthong systems with rising diphthongs in red, falling diphthongs in blue, and height harmonic diphthongs in green. And then on the right, there are the vowel nasal rhymes. Um, it's a lot to take in on this slide and a lot of differences between these varieties, but uh, it's worth at least just looking at uh, long, short vowels and diphthongs because this gives us an idea of some of the trade offs that might have happened in this system. Uh, so if we compare the Tlongjrang Zope variety, uh, we've got uh, six long vowels, whereas in Nuita, we've got seven long vowels, and in Longklang, we have eight. Uh, in Tlongjrang, we've got five short vowels. Nuita has four, and Longklang has three. And uh, Tlongjrang Zope has six diphthongs, where Nuita has five, and Longklang has four. So quite a lot of difference and, and difference in a way that looks like there's been trade-offs between the subsystems. Um, there's also uh, the Tlongjrang Zope variety seems to be lacking a rhyme that they, they've lost. Um, if you'll follow me to the next uh, slide though, we'll take a look at the similarities between these systems, which there are not many. So uh, all of the 
uh, varieties here, or at least all of the rhymes that are found in all of the varieties are on these three diagrams. Um, in black, you can see the rhymes that are shared between all three varieties, and in red, those that are found in only one or two varieties. Um, there's really not much shared between these varieties, as I, as I mentioned. So if you look at the long and short monophthongs on the left, you have a, e, and u, long and short. Those are shared, and then you also have this long a that's shared. Uh, there are no diphthongs that are shared between all three varieties. Um, and then there is uh, the, the vowel nasal rhymes, which are pretty consistent, except this ang, which was lost in favor of i, uh, likely through contact. Um, but we'll start picking apart some of the specific stories. I've got a couple of stories to show here. This is just a small, a small piece, but we can, we can look at a front vowel shift that looks like it's occurred. Uh, if we compare first the Tlongzhuang variety to the Nuitat variety, we see monophthongization of A to E and then centralization of E to E. If we look at the Nuitat variety compared to the Longtlong variety, it looks like there's also been a, a shift uh, uh, in the front vowel space that involved the uh, uh, short E to I and then our ea to ea diphthong. So this raising in the front vowel space continued through these varieties. Um, there's also been uh, quite a lot of back vowel shift, it looks like. So if we compare first uh, uh, the proto kuki chin reconstructions that Kenneth Van Bick has provided, these are uh, largely follow the more conservative kuki chin uh, language, haka lai. Um, we see this change comparing this to the Tlongzhuang variety from a to o, and then from a to o, this diphthongization. So um, it looks like uh, the beginnings of this vowel shift uh, were earlier than the synchronic data that we have. Um, but uh, um, we can see it continuing then if we compare Tlongzhuang to Nuita, we see this o then monophthongizing to u, and then the u centralizing to u, which is this uh, uh, fricated or, or uh, spirantized uh, vowel here. Uh, and this also looks like it's parallel to our front vowel shift, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, we also have this uh, uh, all to a uh, short vowel uh, lower. If we compare the Nui Dut to the Long Plong variety, we see uh, again this all to o change. So it looks like there's actually been an all to o diphthongization th that's happened twice in the history of Zope. Um, and then uh, we also get this raising of ua to uo, which we'll see also works in parallel. So if you'll follow me to the next slide here, um, we see that there are some symmetrical changes. So the a and o diphthongs monophthongizing uh, to e and u, and then centralizing to u and u, if we compare tlongzhang to nuita. And then if we compare nuita to longtlong, we get this uh, ia and ua diphthongs raising to ie and uo. Uh, in summary, uh, Zope varieties really have diverse rhymes despite uh, fairly consistent onsets. Um, but lexical comparison reveals front and back vowel shifts and that are in some cases symmetrical. This is really just one small part of a larger description and analysis of the sound systems of Zope varieties. There's uh, also vowel coalescence. There's some interesting inter and intra speaker variation and onset protection. And then what I'm deep in right now, the very complex tone system, including lexical and grammatical tone. All right. Thank you, Samson. So I'll just make a small plug here. Uh, if you're interested in reading uh, some of Samson's papers on this work, uh, we started a working papers journal here at IU, Indiana Working Papers in South Asian Languages and Cultures, WIPSALC. This is available online. And um, the, the sort of hope for this working papers is that we've got a lot of students, both undergraduate and graduate students, working on this project, and we're trying to really encourage incremental publishing. Um, it's not exclusively for students from Indiana, so if you have students um, who you would like to publish in a, a working papers, that's fine as well. Um, so it's a great place to see some of the, some of the stuff that we're working on right now. Okay, so now I'm going to really pivot and we're going to talk a little bit about community oriented projects and I'm not going to talk a lot about some of these, but again, I'm, I'm happy to answer, you know, we would be happy to answer questions about them at the end. One of the things that we've really been doing is thinking about how to be advocates for our students. Um, 
one concrete thing that we've achieved in the last year is that a lot of our students, although they speak three or four or five languages, we're also having to take Spanish to satisfy an IU language requirement. But we now have um, in writing in the manual that they can test out using Hakka Lai or Burmese. Um, Ken Van Bick is serving as the assessor for us. And uh, our hope is that we'll be able to use other languages for that in the future. We worked really hard to make sure that students only needed to demonstrate uh, verbal proficiency. That's important because although Hakka and Burmese both have writing systems, many of the languages don't. And even those, you know, others that do, like Zope and Lutuv, have writing systems, but they're not widely used. That leads right into the second bullet point. Um, uh, Sui Nempar, who is our Lutuv uh, team member, is really passionate about literacy development. So there is a Lutuv orthography but it is not widely used. And the Lutuv community in general is very interested in developing literacy materials. So they would like the community to be um, uh, making more use of the orthography. So we have been supporting uh, Sui and various students, including Samson, have been working with Sui to uh, write books and publish books in Lutuv over the last couple of summers. We're hoping that Sui will be able to do uh, a master's degree so that she can focus on this um, for longer. And we're pretty interested in providing um, student training and undergraduate research experiences. So generally when Chin students join our team in the early months or year, they may work on other projects, but as they become more comfortable and start figuring out what they like, they start having ideas about research that they would like to do. And we've had some really great projects come out of that. Please ask me about that at the end if you're interested. What I want to talk about, though, is the COVID-19 translation that we've been engaged in for the last couple uh, of months. So basically, in March, as the COVID situation intensified, we had been really focused on the US Census. This was something that um, we had been working on. But our Chin students were very concerned about lack of access to reliable information about COVID-19 in Chin languages. They were um, witnessing a lot of information, uh, uh, misinformation spreading rampantly in the community in Indianapolis. So we turned uh, in March sort of a, a pivot um, and started focusing on translating information, for example, from the CDC and the World Health Organization uh, on COVID-19 uh, into Hakka. So Hakka Lai, because it is the lingua franca, um, is the one that we decided to focus on. And this, um, we created a website. We tried to translate things very quickly, especially in those early days when there was a lot of new information coming out very quickly. Uh, we shared our translations over social media and posted them on our website, which is chinlanguages.org. You're welcome to visit. You'll be able to see more about our other projects there as well. But the um, that that sort of opened the door for this NSF rapid project, providing usable COVID-19 health information to linguistically underserved people. Uh, and this is a collaboration with Shobana and with our colleague, Sarah Champlin, who is in the School of Advertising at the University of North Texas. And yes, Shobana, you've unmuted. So I think we'd like to tell you a little bit about this project. And Shobana, do you wanna do you wanna talk? Sure. Um, if if it's time for me to talk, I will. Uh, <laughs> you know, you set it up very very well. Um, I've been working with Cookie Chin languages for a while, and also wondering how uh, why it is that the communities back in India, um, there we see a lot of you know people passing at a young age uh, from you know things that I thought were preventable, and that is had me thinking about where there's been a gap with uh, not only healthcare availability, but just knowledge about some sorts of prevention and cures for, for common illnesses. And so um, when COVID came around and NSF put out this call for the, for the RAPID program, which is basically, um, you know, quick money for doing a very urgent, uh, you know, uh, project, urgent research project. So, um, it seemed like this COVID may be a way of investigating something about health communication 
And I had heard about Kelly working with with the you know with the Chin communities for doing this translation. So it was just perfect, the perfect kind of combination of of our um, of our two interests. And um, then Sarah Champlin, who is an assistant professor, um, Kelly had mentioned in advertising, has also interested in health information, but um, you know visuals that are used to relay health information. And so she and I talked about um, participating on this project. So the three of us have been looking at various aspects, bringing together um, you know, the training of students um, at IU in uh, language documentation, and then the training of students uh, here at UNT, both in working on uh, translation and transcription, along with Kelly students of the data that we're gonna collect, and then also these visuals uh, so the first question we asked, as you see on this slide, is: Are the visuals that be, are that are being provided by the CDC and other organizations appropriate to the communities that we want to um, be catering to? And what are they understanding from these visuals? Should there be others that are used? So this is part of the kinds of questioning that we're going to be doing um, of people from the Chin community in Indiana. And I think the next slide tells us um, who's going to be doing work. And that's really, I think, the part of this project that we're really very proud of and, and really want to nurture and bring along and use for other projects as well. This is going to be um, questioning of community members by the students um, that are already enrolled um, in classes at IU. And these students are, are getting training in how to do one-on-one -on -one interviews or interviews with family groups via Zoom in the target language. So they're, it's gonna be monolingual field work. They're gonna learn how to collect that material. And another group of students is gonna help with the translation and transcription using Seymour um, for doing the, the time maligned transcription and then uh, another group of students with Samson and other um, graduate students at IU, as well as my students working on the flex transcription. So at the end of all of this, we will have um, a corpus of, of um, naturalistic data, um, conversational data on a topic that we usually don't collect on. And there may be you know, a combination of answers to interview questions, but also um, first person narratives and so on. So all of those will be um, archived with appropriate metadata at the Computational Resource for South Asian Languages, which is a, an archive that we're developing here at the University of North Texas. So all of these things sort of have come together very, very nicely for this. And then finally, um, the idea is to work with Sarah and uh, our, our visuals person and with these um, answers to these interviews to try to come up with some uh, tailored information, health information about COVID prevention and treatment for the Chin community. So I think that's basically the, the project in a nutshell. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that Shobana mentioned that we're trying to think about is whether we can actually design more culturally relevant graphics. And so I really want to kind of draw your attention to this, this first one, which is something that Sarah and her students developed um, in collaboration with Ken Van Bick. As I mentioned earlier um, in this talk, church is just hugely important in Chin social life. So church is the hub of social life. And so Ken um, sort of pointed out that it's actually really important that there be a graphic helping to illustrate the importance of, you know, staying at least six feet apart. So social distancing in the church context, right? So this is one of the things that we hope will come out of um, the project will get all of this conversational data and that will be a really rich linguistic resource and hopefully we're also going to learn about you know what are the graphics that people see that are being mass produced what do those mean where are their gaps how can we present you know better graphics so as to convey really important information i i think you know 
there, there's a lot that we could talk about with regards to this project. So I think that there are a lot of benefits to collecting this kind of, these kind of linguistic data. I also think that um, Shobana and Sarah and I all sort of suspect that COVID-19 is the first of these uh, uh, pandemics, but probably not the last. So our hope is that we're, um, we're problem solving. We're figuring out how to train students to do interviews in Zoom. Uh, and we, we suspect that we'll, we'll need to deploy this kind of uh, model again in the future. Okay, so um, just to sort of wrap up because I think it's always nice to have a conclusion slide is uh, even even when I want to keep talking, it, it makes me stop. Um, so what we've told you about today is the situation where uh, there's a university with a community of speech scientists um, living just an hour away from a community where 30 or more under and unresourced languages are being spoken. So there's just a tremendous number of fieldwork opportunities. Uh, there are also many undergraduate community members who are students at IU who are interested in language work and they're getting confirmation from their uh, church leaders, elders, that language work is valuable. So there's a lot of recognition that uh, students gaining training in how to do this work is valued by the community. So that's sort of a good thing. Um, I really tried to make this be my last slide, but I just had to, I just had to fit one more in. I wanted to sort of share with you that uh, we also have managed to get Hakha Lai um, included in the slate of classes that will be offered this summer in the IU language workshop. So there will be a one month intensive course on Hakka this summer. I will be attending it. I think some other of our team members will be taking this class as well. This is one of the ways in which it's it's sort of nice to see a, a university has the resources. Um, it isn't possible at this point to teach Hakka Lai during the normal school year, but we approached the language workshop. They were really interested in this. Ken Van Bick will be teaching. Um, this is a great opportunity for some of us to get some actual language learning experience with one of the languages that we're working with. So if you are interested in learning Hakka Lai, uh, you can ask us details about that as well. So I think that's it. Um, Kani Lom, thank you. Uh, we're really happy to be here and to talk with you today, and we would be happy to take questions. Wow, thank you. Um, thanks, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. Um, well, I certainly have questions, but um, I, I just wanted to say, um, first of all,